Again, turn to the inner world of your soul. Don't fight things in the outer world that you cannot fight anyway. It's a useless endeavor. It's hopeless. You will not succeed. All right, welcome everyone to this new video. Today I'm going to talk about the female characters of the Steppenwolf. I want to point out Helmina and Maria, and now we also talk about Pablo, a very mysterious jazz musician from South America who plays a vital role in introducing Harihara, the protagonist of the novel, to the world of the unconscious. All right, so the first question is, who is Hermina? Remember, Harihara meets her in this establishment, actually a brothel, called the Black Eagle. He goes in there and he is absolutely mesmerized by her behavior because she does not respect him a bit. She treats him like a child. And Harihara is intrigued. He thinks, well, no one has ever treated me like that, especially not a woman half my age. So immediately he thinks, this is something very, very unique. Now, who is this Hermina? Let's look at her name first. She's called Hermina. Well, Hermina is the female form of Hermann, which is, of course, Hermann Hesse's first name. So, in a way, she's the mirror image of Hermann Hesse and therefore of Harihala. So, she is his female counterpart and she represents the female side of Hari. She also appears to be Beatrix from Dante's Divine Comedy. Now, Beatrix is a very meaningful character in Dante's work because she symbolizes faith. And now it says about Beatrix, Inferno, Beatrice symbolizes divine love. Despite Dante's betrayal and his losing his path, she sees his suffering and chooses to stand by her friend. What she symbolizes with divine love is not scrupulous perfection, but rather a kind of friendship that transcends human limitations and the limitations of nature. She becomes kind of a guide for Harry. And she also has certain supernatural abilities, like seeing things in the future that he cannot see. But she predicts his future. And what she predicts, I'm going to share in a minute. But this also makes her a kind of Sybil-like. And Sybil, was well, she was a blind seer. And she could predict the future because her blindness made her more sensitive to the world, to the unseen aspects of the world that people with normal eyesight would be blind to, ironically. She can predict that Harihala will commit a crime. And this crime will be to kill Hermina or in a way, it's not really Hermina that he's going to kill, but again, her mirror image. This is very significant because if Hermina is his mirror image and he kills her mirror image, wouldn't this imply that he basically kills himself? We'll get to this later on. She's also a temptress and she's also a seductress. She's seducing him. But the thing is, she will not do anything with him. She kind of deflects his desire for her to Maria, who enters the novel a bit later. Now, Hermine is also someone who becomes a kind of teacher and instructor to Harry. So she teaches him how to embrace life, how to enjoy life, how to give up his resistance to enjoy life. She teaches him how to dance and she teaches him how to laugh. Because although Harihala is this very educated, this sophisticated person, he does not seem to have a sense of humor. So he has missed out on the most human parts of life, basically. He cannot let go. He cannot relax. He cannot laugh about things. He's always so serious because the only thing he's focused on is the mind. Rationality is like the male aspect of life. And she brings the female aspect of life into his life. And he was missing this side of him that is able to kind of step back and look at himself with distance and say, I'm ridiculous. I deserve to be laughed at because I'm just a guy. I'm just a human being like everyone else. So I don't have to take myself too seriously. But that's a process he kind of has to learn 
like from scratch because he has been taking himself, his life, and this whole bourgeois thing where he's been living in way too seriously. And now he has to just relax and to gain some distance from himself, from his situation, and from his own past and just reevaluate, kind of revisit his own life and say, wow, well, I mean, it's actually not that bad, is it? And probably if I can learn to laugh at things, then they lose their danger. And I'm not going to be afraid anymore, but he needs someone, he needs a guide to instruct him to do these things. And this is where Hermina steps in. So in a way, she becomes like a mother figure, like a nurturing mother. But she also becomes the only person who is actually able to tame the wolf inside of him. But first, she has to make him realize that there is a wolf inside of him and he has to bring him out. And then she can step in to tame him. And in a way, she also shows him that she is the only person who can make him realize that at his core, he is just a child. And he needs guidance. And she makes him feel that. That he's not that mature and serious person actually. This adult. No. Because basically he has never been a child. He has never allowed himself to be a child. And this is what he also has to learn. Because he has to embrace this curiosity of a child. Like who just steps into the world. And is just so, so, so impressed by everything but he is that serious adult who kind of like has taken on this self-destructive attitude and this self-destructive ego is something that has to be somehow eliminated or just remodeled from scratch and this is what she has to teach him and here Carl Gustav Jung his animus and anima come into play Harry Haller he represents the male side the animus and Hermine represents the female side, the anima. And of course, these two halves are very important. They have to join each other. And if one is dominant over the other, then problems arise. Actually, it's uh, more like a triad, the third element in that triad. I'm just going to explain a little later. But here's what Jung writes about the animus and anima. The archetypes most clearly characterized from the empirical point of view are those which have the most frequent and the most disturbing influence on the ego. These are the shadow, the anima, and the animus. The most accessible of these and the easiest to experience is the shadow. For its nature can enlarge, measure, be inferred from the contents of the personal unconscious. And Jung goes on to point out the anima. The projection-making factor is the anima, or rather, the unconscious as represented by the anima. Whenever she appears in dreams, visions, and fantasies, she takes on personified form, thus demonstrating that the factor she embodies possesses all the outstanding characteristics of a feminine being. In this case, Hermina takes the role of the anima and she steps into Harry's life. And of course, I mean, she takes the role of a feminine being and in this case of his own mirror image, his feminine side, the anima side of his soul, basically. Now, Hamina, she says some very significant things to Harry. One of them is this. Begreifst du das nicht, du gelehrter Herr, dass ich dir darum gefalle und für dich wichtig bin, weil ich für eine Art Spiegel für dich bin, weil in mir innen etwas ist, was dir Antwort gibt und dich versteht. Sei don't you understand, you learned gentleman, that you like me because I'm important to you, because to you I'm a sort of mirror, because within me there is something that gives you answers and that understands you. And she kind of trashes Harry's serious quest that he's been on for all his life, He's fighting against the war and he is, has this noble motivation. He's always seeing like the big picture and he tries to fight against these giant forces. But in a way, he has done nothing to change anything. And Hermina basically holds up the mirror to him and says, see, I mean, your efforts has, have been in vain. What you have to do is like, you have to face your own demons. 
And just don't be distracted by the outer world. So these things you can't change. I mean, you're just a guy, just one single individual. You're not going to stop the war. You're not going to change the economy. The one thing that you can change is you. So why not just start from yourself? But then you will have to face yourself. And this is the one thing you're afraid of, right? So she says... Der Kampf gegen den Tod, lieber Harry, ist immer eine schöne, edle, wunderbare und ehrwürdige Sache. Also auch der Kampf gegen den Krieg. Aber er ist auch immer eine hoffnungslose Don Quixoterie. So the fight against death, dear Harry, is always a beautiful, a noble, a wonderful, an honorable cause. And so is the fight against the war. But it's always like a Don Quixote-like endeavor, and it's hopeless. It can't be won. So it's like Don Quixote's fight against windmills, which he sees as giants. But actually, that's only in his imagination. So he's taking on illusions, projections of his own inner self. It's not real. He's fighting against phantoms. And this is what Harry does. So, again, turn to the inner world of your soul. Don't fight things in the outer world that you cannot fight anyway. It's a useless endeavor. It's hopeless. You will not succeed. And she says, Pass auf, Kleiner. Ich will mit dir um Leben und Tod spielen, Brüderchen. Und ich will dir meine Karten noch ehe wir anfangen zu spielen offen zeigen. Listen up, my little one. I want to play with you. And let's play a game of life and death, my brother. And I will show you my cards. Before we start playing, I will show you my cards. And I will lay them open to you to see. So you will know what you're in for. So how is this a game then? Well, the thing is, he knows what game he's engaging in. But it's also a game that he cannot back out of. He's in this game already. And if Hermina shows her cards, well, it probably also means that he has to show his cards. But of course, he already knows his cards. Du wirst es nicht leicht haben, aber du wirst es tun. Du wirst mein Befehl erfüllen und wirst mich töten. You won't have an easy time, but you will do it. You will fulfill my order and you will kill me. So this is her prophecy. Harry's going to kill her. Of course, she says, how could I ever do something like that? I'm not a killer. I've never killed anyone in my life. I'm against war. I'm against violence. How could I ever kill you? Why well, is the thing? It's not about killing a real person, but it's about killing a side of himself. Remember, we had Jung's definition of animus and anima, and there was the third component, which is the shadow. So you have this triad. You have the shadow, the animus, and the anima, and they all are within one soul. Jung said the easiest one to find, to confront, is the shadow. So in that case, the shadow, of course, is the wolf. And uh, Harry himself, the animus, is like the male rational component. And then Hermina steps in as the female side, like the feminine side of the self. And this becomes very interesting because he also has to confront that. Uh, in a way, they all have to be incorporated just to make him a whole, let's say, complete human being to make his soul complete. And he has to learn how to incorporate all three of them. He will not succeed in doing so. And this is something I'm going to point out in the next video. And now Maria is introduced. Who's Maria? Hermina introduces Maria to Harry. Basically, she gives Maria to Harry. So she's probably 20 years old, very, very young woman. And she's just there to comfort Harry. And she tells him, Du darfst nicht anders sein als du bist. You cannot be someone else. You have to be who you are. So just reveal yourself to me and just be totally and completely honest. Be authentic. And here's like the key point again. It's against this inauthenticity 
of his whole life. Just reveal who you really are to me, you can, okay? Now, the problem is she's not always there. So that means Harry's probably waiting for her and she doesn't really always show up. So in a way, he needs her because he has to confess to her and to confide in her, but she's not always available when he needs her. And uh, Maria is very significant because she also has traits of Hermann Hesse's mother. For instance, her name, she's called Maria. Hermann Hesse's mother's name was Maria. Also, Hermann Hesse's first wife was called Maria too. And um, Maria is kind of also like a teacher. She makes Harry aware of his own body and his like physical needs because she understands that. And Harry does not understand his own body. So she makes him pay more attention to his body, to his physicality, not only his mind, because he is a man of the mind, he's an intellectual, he's an author, he's an artist. And because of her abilities and of her lovemaking skills, she's able to relax Harry. He was very tense, and now she's able to break this tension and makes him just totally relaxed. And so also, one of the aspects that Harry really likes about her is her scent. And it's Maria's scent that really makes him relax. Because scents are perceived subconsciously. It's something you cannot intellectualize. It's something you cannot express with words. It's just something that affects you on your deepest subconscious level. And Maria also makes Harry appreciate the world, the modern world. So Maria is like a child of her time. She likes to go shopping. She likes fashion. She likes jewelry. She likes all the things that Harry deems to be inappropriate and futile stuff. So basically, she's like the antidote to Harry's disgust of the world. Von all den Überraschungen, den Hermine mich bisher ausgelöst hatte, war dies die heftigste. Denn daran zweifle ich keinen Augenblick, dass sie es war, die mir diesen Paradiesvogel zugesandt habe. Of all the surprises that Hermine had in store for me, this one was the heaviest. He means that she gave him Maria. I did not doubt one second that she sent this bird of paradise to me. Of course, there's like a Faustian motif in here. In Goethe's Faust and Hesse was an admirer of Faust. In The Steppenwolf, Harry Haller is an admirer of Goethe because Goethe is one of the wolves. Johann Wolfgang Goethe, the other one being Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And Maria kind of represents that the Gretchen motif. Heinrich Faust, the aging scholar, falls in love with a very young woman, Gretchen. He's being rejuvenated again by the youthfulness of this young woman and also is able to reconnect with his body, his physicality, which he had forgotten about because of his intellectual endeavor. And then, of course, it means to reconnect with life itself. It's a kind of resurrection. So he used to be dead to himself, but now he comes to life again just because He was missing that spark, and now the spark that he feels because of this young woman reignites his passion for life. And here's a definition about Maria. Inkarnierte Männer fantasy in Symbolfigur der Weiblichkeit, die Halland vermeintlich weibliche Lebensbreite einweist. Dabei oft Stereotyp dargestellt. Maria hat kaum Sprechanteile, ist dagegen häufiger Gegenstand des Gesprächs. So Maria is kind of like a typical reincarnated uh, male fantasy, a symbolic figure of femininity that introduces Harry to female ways of life, body, seduction, feeling. Uh, she's a very stereotypical figure. Uh, Maria doesn't really talk, but is being talked about. Like, mit Hermine sprach ich oft lang und sachlich über Maria. I talked to Hermine very long about Maria. She's compared to flowers, ihr Blumengesicht, the face of a flower, aufblühender Blick, like a blooming gaze. Meine schöne, schöne Blume, my beautiful, beautiful flower. But she only lives for the moment, that's what it seems. And she likes consumption. She's a passive object of male actions. Lässt sich kaufen und aushalten. She can be bought and spoiled. And she's very passionate as well. So these are the two women that become part of Harry's life. 
Hermine is the guide and Maria kind of becomes also a sort of guide who makes him totally relaxed and he reconnects with his body, which is very important. And now Pablo comes into play. Who is Pablo? So Pablo's Hermina's friend. And remember Harry, he worships Mozart. He's one of the wolves, like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and the other wolf is Goethe. Harry does not like any music except classical music. And Mozart is the epitome of the peak of musical genius. Now Pablo is a jazz musician. It's improvisation. It's passionate. It's not music of the mind. It's music of the, the feeling. And so this is the actual opposite to Mozart. And Harry has to confront his own disgust of this modern music. And Pablo is the guy who introduces him to open his mind to this jazz music, which is, in a way, a very passionate music. So Pablo becomes a kind of therapist for Harry. He also is a master of using drugs. He's a magician. He uses opium to induce certain states of relaxation. And now he also is, in a way, the one person in charge of the magical theater, which will become very, very important in the next chapter. And the magical theater is the place where Harry frees himself from himself. But he has to descend into this magical theater. And the only way he can do this is because Pablo makes him able to go down there. Because through his use of drugs, he makes Harry encounter his own self. And he has to learn how to deal with these parts of his personality, which have become marginalized. And he has tried to just exclude from his soul. He did not want anything to do with them. It's like the anima and the shadow. And Pablo teaches him how to reincorporate them, or he actually tries to. And then he can go into the magic of theater. Pablo himself seems to be from South America. So he's kind of like an exotic character in that German or Swiss, who knows, environment. And he has no bourgeois identity. He's the exact opposite of the bourgeois because he lives this bohemian kind of lifestyle. He's also part of the, let's say, the world of the criminals, the underground world that is not part of the bourgeois lifestyle. So it's the world that does not subscribe to the bourgeois morality. It's a world that is separated from it, that only comes to life when the bourgeois world goes to sleep at night. And that's when Harry can enter this world because he himself has to leave the realm of the bourgeois. And the thing is, in that underground world, he encounters love, he encounters people who care for him, and he encounters compassion. The things he has been missing in his own environment all of his life. And how Harry makes his way through the magic of theater, I will talk about in the next video. So thank you very much for watching. See you next time.